I am Nicholas Borneus of Capital Inc. and I would like to welcome you all to the first panel discussion of uh, today's forum. Uh, this panel will be on Jones Act container shipping and the supply chain. Container shipping is one of the most important uh, trades uh, in uh, the Jones Act space and uh, we are delighted to have with us a, a terrific panel of major uh, sector participants. I will uh, turn it over to John Keo, the partner at uh, Clyde & Company, who is going to uh, moderate the panel. Thank you, John, and thank you to all of you for uh, participating in this very important uh, panel discussion. The floor is yours and you can introduce the panelists. And thank you again. Great, thank you, Nicholas, and thank you all for, for attending today. We have, a, uh, we have a terrific panel here to address the Jones Act container shipping and supply chain topics. Uh, my name is John Keogh. I am a partner at Clyde Co. based in the New York office. I am a co-head of the firm's maritime trading and energy practice. Uh, before I begin, I would just like to note that, that the thoughts of all of us are with those who are uh, impacted in the Ukraine by the, uh, the uh, terrible events going on over there and uh, not to lose sight of that today. Um, I would say as a sanctions lawyer, one of the specialties that I focus on that, that it's, uh, it's an, a, a very active time and the impact on the global uh, supply chain by the swiftly imposed sanctions that are occurring on a global basis uh, uh, is something we're all watching uh, very closely. Uh, we have a wonderful panel here today, as Nicholas says, leaders in the industry. We have Brett Bennett, Senior Vice President and General Manager at Crowley Maritime, Joel Wine, CFO of Matson Inc., Chris Hamlin, Senior Vice President and General Manager at Pasha, Hawaii, Eduardo Pagan, Vice President and General Manager of Tote Maritime. And last but certainly not least, Mitch Luciano, CEO of Trailer Bridge. Gentlemen, it's good to have you all with us today. Um, Joel, why don't, I, why don't I kick things off with you? And I'm just going to, going to light the fuse and, and throw this thing out there for everyone. Uh, can you give us our view on, on comparing and contrasting, if you will, how is the Jones Act container market and supply chain performed in the last year uh, relative to the known non-Jones Act or the or the international container market. Okay, thanks, John. And, um, good morning, everybody. And uh, um, I welcome um, and echo your comments about the situation in Ukraine. Our, our thoughts are certainly with all those people uh, today. Uh, your question on the Jones Act. Thank you for that question. So um, it's very interesting. Matson, just by way of background, we are, participate heavily in the Jones Act markets in the Pacific, uh, primarily Hawaii, Alaska, and Guam. We also participate actively in the Trans-Pacific market, primarily from Ningbo, Shanghai uh, to Long Beach. So we've got uh, a number of operations and trade lanes that participate in both markets. And to compare the, the two, in the last uh, two years during the pandemic is um, it's definitely a tale of two different, very different situations. The Jones Act markets, the, the punchline is uh, very clearly, things have been operating extremely normally. Uh, we've had ups and downs with a little bit of labor availability. Sometimes that's impacted terminal operations. Uh, and, uh, we've had to take uh, very precautionary measures to protect our crews on ships because of the pandemic, things like that, of course, which every shipping company has had to deal with. But, Freight has been moving. Terminals have been operating well in places like Honolulu, Anchorage, Alaska, and in Guam. And compare that with the Trans-Pacific market, which is the headline news and front and center with supply chain congestion, especially uh, out here on the West Coast, um, which, where you've had you know, very, very significant uh, delays in terminals themselves and a lot of other choke points along the supply chain. So I think the message for your audience and people participating in this, uh, in this forum is that the Jones Act has been working. It's primarily designed to provide stability to these markets along with a lot of other measures uh, around uh, jobs and um, uh, merchant marine availability, all the important elements of Jones Act. But fundamentally, if there's a question around does the Jones Act lead to um, um, less uh, 
stability and ability to deliver for U.S. customers um, from port to port. I think this, this environment is going to look very well in history as the uh, junk back is delivered extremely well for these, uh, these economies. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. Chris Hamlin, what your experience, please, on the same point. Yeah, no, I agree with uh, with Joel as well. And if you look at the uh, the on time uh, arrivals uh, for uh, for our vessels over the last two years, uh, they're very much in line with uh, the same same statistics over the last five years. Right. So we really have not seen an impact in uh, in vessel delays or cargo delays uh, getting in and out of the uh, in and out of the islands. And I do think. You know, the Jones Act is more insulated uh, compared to uh, the international market. And what I mean by that is, you know, uh, there's, there's dedicated chassis in the fleet. There's dedicated truckers uh, in the fleet, as well as, you know, in some, some cases, dedicated terminal and or dedicated berths. So we're not competing, you know, with the international market uh, for the same uh, pool of, of, of drivers and, and chassis like we're hearing in terms of other supply chain disruptions. And and able to get in and out of the islands without uh, without any issues. How about you, Brett? Yeah, th thanks, Chris. Brett, could you share your your experiences at Crowley? On yeah, that? sure. So, thank you, and and our thoughts are with the Ukrainian people. Thank you for opening with that. Uh, really, when we look in talking specifically to Puerto Rico, there's stability in, in all facets, and and there's still capacity in the market. That market's served by four different carriers. And all these American carriers, we use Jones Act a lot, but these are American carriers serving, serving these areas. And I think that's important, employing, employing Americans and, and, and Puerto Ricans in the Puerto Rican trade. So uh, we, are, are, we are being impacted by our cost to serve is going up. And it, a lot of it is related to general inflation and also a spillover effect from the global and trans-Pacific crisis. There's rail congestion. There's delays and the related cost increases to that truck supply related cost in, in, increases to the to the tr to the truck supply and demand, uh, LNG diesel bunker all those all those prices are are, are going up, uh, and then you look at some of the other areas that are impacted. We serve Puerto Rico with specialized equipment. We have 53 foot equipment that's not normal in the international trade. We have 45. 102 equipment, which is 102 inches wide versus 90, 96 inches wide, right? And or 98, it's 96 inches wide, and that that's a differentiator for the market. But we have to get that stuff manufactured in Asia, and we got to get it over here. If manufacturing prices are up 40 percent, the cost to get those, if you can even get it moved from China and into the trade, is is uh, three times similar to what the customers are seeing in the trans-Pacific trade. So, you know. Fortunately, you look at the American carriers and the heavy investment. You talk about Crowley. We spent over a half a billion dollars just a handful of years ago, right, to bring in modern ships, to bring in LNG ships, to modernize the terminals, right? And that investment has allowed stability to be in place. And we're not the only one. All the other Jones Act carriers over Puerto Rico have done the same thing. And that's allowed us, you know, echoing on, on Chris's comments, to really be there and bring stability uh, to, to the market, which is, is really important. Finally, uh, we've been in Puerto Rico for 68 years. We consider ourselves a local company. We have over 300 employees there uh, and their families. So what we do in Puerto Rico is very personal to us. And I know that's the case for all the Jones Act carriers, involvement in community and, and, and so on. So we're going to do everything we can, though we're facing general inflation, though we're facing spillover effect from the global and the trans-Pacific trade crisis, we're going to do everything we can to lower our cost to serve Puerto Rico in the face of these rising costs. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. And, and Eduardo. Uh, for Tote Maritime, your view, please, on the same point and some of the challenges you're facing and how you're managing with that yeah. in Puerto good, Rico. Good morning, uh, good, good morning uh, John, and to the, and to the audience. I, I do echo you, your expressions about the situation in, in, in Ukraine and, and wish for the best uh, for, for them in, the, in that sense. Uh, in, in our case, uh, not very dissimilar to some of the comments being already provided by, by the other panelists. Uh, we, we, we in Puerto Rico experience a significant growth, and this is not only told, everybody had the, the, the same opportunity. And, and to be able to, to deal with that, uh, with, the, uh, with the additional uh, capacity in our tonnage, and even our plans to even bring more tonnage if needed, uh, was some, something that 
certainly help us, you know, deliver consistently and, and reliably on the on the service that we actually provide to the people of Puerto Rico and in, in, the, in that sense. So again, we had a significant growth and, and our service levels were not truly affected at all by, 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 by the situation. Uh, I think one element to add to what has been said already is that the, uh, the, the management uh, of our people, particularly back office personnel, uh, commercial and, and others, and to, and, to, and to immediately went into a remote mode uh, to, to work was something really smooth and, and fantastic uh, done by our teams in, in, in the Jones app. You have to remember, we are an island that had go through several uh, uh, issues in the past and in, in relation to hurricanes, uh, earthquakes, and others. So we do have very strong uh, uh, resiliency plans, very strong business continuity plans. And even though no one can claim that they did a simulation before on something like the pandemic, we cannot deny that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the exercises we did before well, with those plans help us a lot in, in managing particularly people moving from, uh, from the offices to, to, to operate from their houses from one day to another. Can and, you give us one, can you give us an example of that, Eduardo? Sure. Uh, you, uh, you I'll, I'll, give, I'll, I'll give you a, a very personal example. In, in, in the case of, of uh, Toad Puerto Rico, we have been operating since the, uh, an action, since the inception of the pandemic uh, with more than two thirds of our employees uh, working from their houses. That's still the case today. We still, we still have probably close to 70% of our employees, both in Jacksonville as, uh, as well as in Puerto Rico, working from, uh, from, from their houses. And, uh, and, and it's really great to say that we didn't have any, any real, real failure in service and, and to, to, to the customer that we service because of that factor. You know, the ability to move the, uh, the, the back office, the, uh, the uh, computers and, and other accessories to their houses to, to work in, in, in immediately was done totally smoothless. And, and, and again, that wasn't done by, by coincidence. I mean, there were a lot of pre-planning on that type of activity for other type of events that could have happened. And we just took advantage at this time that, that the pandemic actually forced uh, a much bigger, you know, uh, uh, of, of the office uh, work environment in, in that sense. Thanks, thanks very much, Eduardo. And Mitch, let me ask you the same question. Uh, and, and really, if you could compare uh, your experience in the Jones Act container market uh, over the last year or so with, with uh, the international market experience and how you're meeting some of those challenges as well. Thank you, John. And thank you um, for the opportunity to sit on this panel and, and, and have these conversations with everybody here. Um, I, I would tell you that, you know, the biggest challenges when we talk to customers is you know, they'll tell you it's the inconsistencies in the supply chain. It's tough for them to manage when raw goods are coming in or tough for them to manage when they can manufacture. You know, you have half of the product you need to make the product your, your, for the full product. And one of the things that the Jones Act, and I can speak to Puerto Rico because obviously we serve Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands and Dominican Republic, is the, you know, I think it's been said, you know, I echo a lot of the things that people have said so far is, is the consistency. They're able to schedule um, when, when customers, when, when IV bags need to come out of Puerto Rico, they can schedule those things here in the U.S. where it's the inconsistencies in some of the other markets, uh, the international market. I mean, I know at home we're waiting six months for a dresser that we ordered. I mean, that's inconsistent. You know, that doesn't make any sense. We're, and the Jones Act, you know that ship is going to, barge is going to be there on Monday. You know it's going to be there on Wednesday. And they have trucks ready to get those containers out of the port. And that's, that's a major deal. I mean, it gets out of the port and I think for most of us here, probably less than 30 minutes. Um, and that's a major factor for our customers um, getting their product to their warehouse. So I think the, the, the biggest piece is that, and, and they can bank on that. And that's, that's what I hear from customers is that we thank you for the consistency. It, it makes a difference in, in how we're able to operate. Thanks, Mitch. And we don't want to, uh, in this forum, I just generally say, I think everybody agrees, we don't want to get into any kind of detailed discussion about pricing, uh, factors but but can you can you describe just generally what what that challenge has been Mitch as a Jones Act in the Jones Act container market how, how is pricing I, I think for the whole transportation the market, market it's not I don't know if it's specifically Jones Act it's it's costs costs have gone up you know fuel's gone up truck driver costs have gone up the per mile rates have gone up and 
you know, we as, at least for Trailer Bridge, we, we try to absorb as much as we can and have open discussions with customers. You know, you try not to change it too drastically. Um, you know, but that's that's probably the biggest piece. Labor costs have gone up, fuel's gone up. And it's, we see it everywhere. It's not just, you know, for Jones Act. It's, you know, we have a logistics division and we've seen in the logistics side that the DAT reported, you know, $3.20 a mile dry van rate um, this past couple of weeks. I mean, that's a dollar... 80 two years ago to 320 that's a big difference in costs and so it's it, it's affecting everybody whether you're you know jones act carrier domestic carrier um or an international carrier everyone's being impacted by that and, and how you manage that is is uh, is a piece right now and I, and I think again that goes to the you know we we remain consistent and our, and our customers have appreciated that and that's been the biggest piece thanks mitch joel in the supply chain, the uh, the challenges that, that you've seen with labor, could you describe a little of what you're seeing in the market and what sort of remedies you're anticipating for that? Sure, sure, John. So um, at the current moment, the biggest shortage in labor is probably on the truck power side. Um, there's other there's other points in supply chain where there's um, not as much labor available. Um, but it's but the other issue over the last uh, two years in the pandemic has been the episodic, episodic nature of sometimes full labor, labor availability, sometimes 95 percent where you can kind of get things moving. But when you have a period of even just a few weeks where maybe it's down to 85 or 80 percent, let's say, of longshore and working at the terminal, then you then you face very significant bottlenecks. And the period of time to de-bottleneck after that becomes very excruciating and takes a longer period of time. So at the, at the core of where these bottlenecks began was labor, a lack of labor availability and the ability to fluidly move uh, cargo, uh, primarily at the terminals, at least in the case of the West Coast. Um, and shortly thereafter, you did have truck power kind of issues. And so, um, it, and so all your, and that exacerbates itself into our asset terms, which are incredibly important to think about both in terms of vessels and in terms of uh, equipment and, and containers, but primarily chassis. So as you had less availability of, of, to discharge cargo and then for power to move the, the freight out of the terminal to a customer distribution center, and then within the distribution center itself, where there'd be labor availability in the warehouses to process the freight and then bring back the empties to the, to the terminal, all those turn, time, turn times began to inch up and then it dramatically increased at the end of 2020 into 2021 and continue today. So that has led to something like a chassis that would normally turn in four or five days from your terminal out to a customer distribution center and come back, maybe doubling in terms of um, uh, capacity turn time, which means all of a sudden you had an extreme lack of capacity of assets to move the freight. And the same things happened on the, on the vessel side. So a lot of vessel rotations that were 35 day rotations and can happen with five ships have inched back to 42 or 49 or 56 days because of port congestion. And now instead of meeting five ships, you need six ships or seven ships, or you have blank sailings where you can't have a weekly sailing. So there's been the lack of labor availability has, been, has led to a lack of asset availability, which is which is exacerbated with choke points. So the solution to all of this is very complex, but also very simple. We're going to need many, many months, if not quarters or longer, of full availability of both la of labor primarily, but then assets eventually to de bottleneck. And that's going to have to happen at every choke point in a consistent way, which is not going to happen in a month or two. It's going to take a long time to, to de bottleneck all these choke points. And they're not obviously not just in the United States, but choke points all over. But the core of it. That's, that's, that's why the labor uh, lack of availability is, as COVID hit various regions and various labor pools really, really uh, bottom up things and things like that. And so as the, as the capacity of assets improves, you still have the labor challenge that you need to tackle, right? To relieve those choke points? We do, and, and now on top of it, we have a very significant increase in inflation across all categories. And at the core of it is labor inflation. And it's, it's, it's office workers, it's knowledge workers, it's labor workers moving freight in lots of different categories. So you, now you also have a challenge of getting people back to work and what's the, what's the rate of which they're going to go back to work as things normal. You know, Mitch made the point about um, driver, you know, uh, cost, of, cost of delivery and trucker costs. And so we're in a very squishy world right now, which is not clear where these costs are going to land. We know they're going to be higher, 
but as, as uh, independent drivers or unionized drivers or unionized workforce renegotiate um, in the new world, what, what are all those inflationary factors going to be? Are they going to be three, four, five percent? Are they going to be seven, eight percent? There's very big deltas here, and that's going to impact the entire economy and the overall uh, inflation equation. Thanks, Joel. Chris, let's let's turn to you on that squishiness topic. The uh, <laughs> the, the labor, the inflation. What are your uh, what are your views on that? And, yeah, no, I agree with a lot of the points uh, Joel made, right? And and one thing with the pandemic, there was there was no facet of the supply chain that was uh, immune to it, right? So it impacted it impacted it from uh, from 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 start to finish, right? So there was labor um, availability challenges at origin, you know, at suppliers through through vessel crews, you know, with the contract tracing and and quarantining, you know, all the way down to obviously the marine terminals on the, uh, the lower 48, and then Hawaii, and then the truckers, right? So it's easy to just talk about trucker trucker challenges or labor at the port, but it was really across the board. And then once you do have the truckers and the and the labor to get all the uh, the boxes in and out of the terminals, you know, there was challenges over at the uh, the depots, right, to get to, to get the boxes unloaded and then trying to get them returned. Um, so when you have these shortages, then then you are relying on uh, you know the rest of the uh, the rest of the team to try and try and make up for that. And then frankly, because you don't have enough people, people tend to take time off. There's enough work to, for everybody to work seven days a week, right? So a lot of them, you know, they're able to pick and choose their schedule because, you know, financially, if you're a, if you're a truck driver or a, a laborer, you know, if you've got available work seven days a week, two shifts, then you're going to start choosing it, right? And then, so it's hard from a, um, from a planning perspective to, to know what is your labor availability? Because, you know, what is the burnout point for, uh, for certain drivers and, and, and certain laborers? But I do think, you know, we're starting, we're starting to see a lot better uh, numbers, obviously, on the COVID trending. So we're starting to see some more uh, uh, consistency on, uh, on, on COVID and labor availability. But as Joel pointed out, this is, not a, uh, this is not now that we've got consistency, it gets fixed tomorrow or next, uh, next week, next month. This is going to happen over, uh, over several quarters. Brent, how about your views on that topic, on, the, on, on, on relieving these choke points? The labor, the asset capacity. What are you? Uh, what are you seeing at Crowley on that? Well, we don't face the complexity that the, that the West Coast faces today, right? That being said, we're, we're still impacted, right? And and you know we're we're dealing with crew shortages on the railroads, right? That are delaying on dock rail pools or the, the rail terminals are, are congested. This all goes back to labor, whether COVID related or people are using this opportunity to. Uh, go to a new career or advance or go make more money somewhere else. Uh, we're seeing pretty much increases across all areas, whether it be admin employees looking to retain talent as, as uh, uh, people are in you know, the economy is doing pretty well and people have the opportunity to better themselves. We're all for that. Um, and, you know, but we're seeing truck drivers is an ongoing issue. We, we provide 60% of our own trucking either through our employees or our independent contractors. Um, terminal labor, we've got a dedicated Teamster force, so whether it's in San Juan or Port Everglades or Jacksonville, right, we've, we've got that audience that comes to our terminal every day. So we don't have the complexity or the all-on pressures that the West Coast has, but we're still seeing it for sure, right, in, in really all, all areas. And at a minimum, there's shortages causing delays, and in some cases, we're seeing some folks exit and go to a, to a different industry. Thank you. How about the capacity, the asset capacity uh, issue, Brett? Is, are you able to, is there an opportunity there for, for Crowley where you've been able to step in and assist in any, any respect with American flag? Uh, for, for sure. And thank, thank you for asking that. So one, there's ample capacity in, in uh, the Puerto Rico trade. We actually accelerated barges this past year to, to help meet some of that added demand earlier in the first half of the year. In addition, when we've seen some of these global carriers focus on the line haul, reduce the number of their port calls, right? They, they on the East Coast in, in particular, and it happened on the West Coast as well, we were able to step in with a U.S. flag barge solution. And we served as a coastal barge uh, to help uh, meet some of our customers' needs who had cargo stranded in Norfolk and maybe they needed it in Charleston or somewhere else. So that was a solution that the Jones Act uh, U.S. flag carrier the Mariners brought to the table. Great. Thanks, Brett. Mitch, did you want to comment on that from the Trailer Bridge perspective? 
in terms of these choke points and the labor issues? Yeah, internally for Trailer Bridge, I don't, you know, we haven't had like the labor issues at, at terminals and stuff like that. Our, our big thing, and, and echoing what Joel and Chris and, and Brett already said, it, the biggest issue for us is, is, is the truck drivers. You know, when we have, we'll have uh, 30 containers coming down on the train on, on CSX that has to get on the barge on, on Friday. And because they, the train has, CSX has nowhere to put these containers because there's no drivers picking up other containers. It sits there till Sunday or Monday. And now, you know, that, that starts to create a little bit of an issue for our customers. Um, the other piece I would say is, I think Joel hit on this, Chris hit on this, is a customer shortage of labor. When we are delivering, you know, our, our average turn time used to be 42 days on, on containers. Now we're approaching 50 because our, our container gets to a customer. They can't unload it. You know, they don't have, they don't have the labor to unload it. Or we have customers in the U.S. that normally give us five to six shipments a week with eight drop trailers, eight drop containers. And now they're giving us two at those eight. And it's just it continuing to increase the turn times on the equipment. And so, you know, they're like, hey, no, keep, keep those containers here because we're going to hire a bunch of people next week. And it just does like, where are you getting them from? So, you know, it's not happening as fast. It is starting to happen. I think we're starting to see that. Um, but it's not happening as, as quickly as, as they pointed out. It's going to take 2023 before we see any potential real relief or, or even going back close to the numbers that, that we need before. So that's been, and it's, like I said, start drivers and start to labor at, at these facilities. Uh, those are the big, big choke points. So as the capacity increases still, the, the labor stress is a, is, is a factor you're trying to resolve. Yeah. I mean, those, those 10, 11 million jobs that they say is out there, I bet you half of them are in these facilities. So, I mean, it, it's, you know, we got to get people in there to, to start unloading and loading uh, containers manufacturing. Thanks, Mitch. Eduardo, how about, how about from your perspective at Tote? You know, in, in our case, many, many points are similar to what uh, Mitch and, and Brett mentioned. And particularly, you know, the situation of the West Coast versus the East Coast. You, you know, in the case of Puerto Rico, more than 80% of the cargo actually comes from the Midwest of the U.S. over to, to the East Coast, particularly over to, to, to Jacksonville. And, and even a significant portion of that percentage actually comes at about 150 miles uh, radius from, from, from Jacksonville. So from that perspective, uh, the labor issues on the West Coast were not really a factor in, 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 in our case. Uh, as far as uh, the trucking, uh, we obviously didn't suffer much about it. Uh, we have a very uh, small uh, number of partners in the trucking industry that had really worked with us in different type of uh, simulations, again, in managing some crisis. And, and I have to say that we were quite blessed on, on having many, many uh, uh, sailings without a single uh, disruption for, for, for trucking services. And just to give you an idea, we, we do about, you know, uh, 2,000 containers a week on our, on, our, uh, on our ships. And to have many of those vessels coming uh, with a full integrity on the service from the trucking was actually a, a major accomplishment. Another factor about labor in Puerto Rico that didn't affect much our industry is the fact that uh, our employees and, and, and the organized labor that actually service us has a very, very decent uh, total compensation. Uh, these were people that were not entitled to go for the federal funding, like the majority of the people of the island. So having the pool of people to service uh, our business in Puerto Rico uh, reliably and consistently was out there all, 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 all the time. In, in that sense, um, contrary to, to some places in the U.S., the way the, the I'll take the, the poor as, as, an, as an example, the, the pandemic unemployment was based on U.S. Uh, average uh, uh, rates. And, and that's why, you know, $600 a week was probably about in line to what many people made in the U.S., but not the case in Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, for many people, those $600 a week represented twice or three times more money what they, what they used to. But that case, again, did not affect the, uh, the, the, the transportation industry much because our, comp our employees were uh, already at a compensation level that they were not entitled for that type of benefit. So we were, we were fairly you know, blessed on, 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 on having those factors and uh, paying in our favor in, the, in that sense. Thanks, thanks Eduardo. Chris Hamlin, what's the, uh, what's the fact that's most keeping you up at night these days then in this, supply chain congestion uh, time, or are you sleeping pretty peacefully these days? You know, for the, for the Jones Act, we're, we're sleeping 
fairly peacefully, right? And it's because we have to, right? I mean, you know, speaking with Hawaii, it's a, it's a just-in-time environment, right? So we have to have vessels on time. We have to maintain our uh, our reliability. So we're doing everything in our power to make sure that happens. If that's, you know, paying paying more for, for, for drivers, obviously, you know, fuel and other supply chain challenges. And that's that's certainly what we're doing and, and, and we're having to do it. The, uh, the economic what is viability What is the fuel of, cost? Of, of, what, let me... Let me just ask the fuel cost factor. How are you, how are you dealing with that, and and your customer base? How are they dealing with it? Yeah, you know, in Hawaii we have, uh, you know, we have uh, published fuel surcharges, and and they get adjusted, you know, accordingly in line with, uh, with 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 fuel pricing, right? And there's been an upward trend over over last year, and you know, the fuel fuel is an up and down model, and and obviously right now with the uh, with the crisis in uh, with Russia and Ukraine, is uh, it's starting to spike a little bit more, but it's um, you know it's, it's it's very fluid. Thanks, Chris. Joel, did you want to comment on on that from your perspective? Just dealing with the fuel cost factor in in this whole equation is that is that yeah, a large a, issue that you're wrestling with, keeping you awake a little bit? Yeah, well, I'd say. Um, there's other issues that are taking more mind share. <laughs> um, so I'm happy to comment on it if you care, but uh, on the fuel side, on the fuel side, um, we do have very effective uh, fuel subtraction mechanisms in the Jones Act trades. So it's our job to be extremely efficient and then we pass on the ups and downs, you know, on the upside and then lower on the downside where the fuel costs are. Um, that's not the case in the international trades. There's a fuel surcharge mechanism that tends to be um, an all in pricing type of market. So. It's critical in that market, of course, as well, to maintain um, very efficient fuel operations. It is a significant component of the cost structure, but our models differ in, in the sense that we are an expedited ocean carrier that can beat as much against um, air freight as we do slow moving ocean freight. So fuel is important, but the most important thing is customer cargo availability that's reliable and fast and, and uh, speedy. But the, the, the big things that we're worried about and thinking about John, on that on that part of your question, is um, it's not it's not a worry so much as we just understand that we're in a very very changing environment, and we believe that the new normal is not going to look anything like before. And I, I don't even think there's going to be a new normal. I think there's going to be continuous change for a number of years. Some things we know have changed very permanently, at least we think we know and are confident, and, that, and that starts with the consumer. There'll, there'll be there's been a big move towards much more e-commerce purchasing with everybody at home during the pandemic. But on the other side of this, there'll still be a big increase of e-commerce and ordering goods to show up at your door than we were, where, where we were in 2019. So that's going to fundamentally change supply need. Supply chains are going to have to fundamentally change to make that product available because the consumer is spoiled and and once the once something to arrive within 48 hours of the, at their door, and if they can't get it, they're going to go buy something else. Uh, you're going to miss the sale. So that's a fundamental change supply chains need to adapt to. And then the other piece that uh, for um, for our customers and anyone that's selling a manufactured product or a consumable good is the need to adjust supply chains for resiliency and redundancy. In this environment where you may potentially lost sales and potentially lost sales of high margin goods. It makes no sense to have um, a supply chain that can't handle uh, uh, resiliency or redundancy and it's not as reliable if you got a high margin good. It's better to spend a, another percent or two uh, on your cost of goods to make sure that you've got that product available to sell to get the high margin, gross margin sale if you're the, uh, if you're the uh, consumer product company um, so, so you don't let down your customers and you continue to get your sales. So, so that goes to everything in terms of vendor, uh, more vendor um, diversification, uh, and that will flow through ports of origination diversification, that will flow through ports of destination diversification, and different supply chains to deliver all the way through uh, surface transportation distribution centers and final mile, all the way to the U.S. consumer. So all those things are going to be changing significantly for years to come. And then the other thing, John, on top of all of it, is environmental changes. Of course, there's never been a time we've had more impact on ESG and the environmental side, and we're all in you know, fuel, fossil fuel consuming businesses right now. We all wanna get out of that and get as clean as we can. And the rules are moving as far in that direction, which is a global good, but that has so many implications on our assets and how we move freight 
And those rules are, are, are we, we, I said squishy earlier, those rules are squishy and being defined and they're gonna change. We all know they're gonna change over time. So you just have so what many steps do you see? Right now. What steps uh, can you describe for us some of the steps on the, on the environmental or ESG uh, side that, that you're taking at Matson? We're, well, we've we invested a billion dollars in, in four new vessels that were delivered uh, two, three years ago. And we are, we've said publicly, we're looking at potentially three new vessels that we might order in, in the next 12 to 18 months. All, if that's that four, and if we do order three more, all those would be L, LNG dual fuel. So we could run on a traditional um, uh, low and high, high content sulfur fuels, but also, um, but also LNG. And the LNG burn on those kind of vessels would significantly reduce carbon emissions. So that is a very, very big step forward um, in terms of our overall um, um, emissions platform. And then we've also announced that we are re-engineering one of the older vessels from a traditional um, uh, diesel engine to um, an all LNG, uh, all, all LNG or dual, dual fuel capable engine. But, we, but I, there's also a, a lot of belief in the marketplace. LNG is just a bridge uh, fuel, and it, it, it bridge meaning maybe five or 10 years. But as we look at 2030 and beyond, the industry on a global basis does not have the answer yet in terms of what are the best fuels for the future that are going to really reduce our carbon emissions beyond where LNG would be. And so the industry on a global basis needs to invest in R&D so we can, is it going to be ammonia? Is it going to be hydrogen? Is it going to be other biofuels that are dropping fuels and you have engines that can handle all these different types of fuels as the technology evolves? Those are all open questions that it's very difficult for one company, it's, it's not possible for one company to really drive that it has to be done on a global, on really a global industry R&D basis. Um, but we've taken big steps within Matson to move our fleet to, um, to uh, uh, less carbon emissions emitting LNG fleet. And we've announced um, our plans to get to a 40% reduction by 2030, uh, which is just right around the corner um, in line with those investments in, uh, in LNG fuel vessels. Thanks, Brett. How about you? With the uh, the factor that's giving you the most uh, difficulty sleeping at night, and and perhaps you could comment on where in all that mind space you're fitting the ESG element. That yeah, uh, sure enough. Well, we've committed to net zero emissions by 2050 across all scopes. So we we uh, we are all in. Uh, on, on the environmental side, socially, we're active, we're, we're heavily active in, in our communities and driving d &I initiatives. And these are really organic initiatives as well. We have employee resource groups representing anywhere from the military to black professionals to LGBTQT+, uh, that, that are helping us mold what we should look like in an organization and how do we attract talent and retain talent to drive us forward, right? The final part is governance. We think we got to uh, do a pretty good job of that and, and stand on to that to keep us and our customers off of 60 minutes. So the things that keep me up at night, uh, there's three things. One, inflation. We've talked about that. Rising cost, right? That's It's going to be, it can be at times a little bit difficult to keep up with. The, the Ukrainian crisis is probably going to add to that and accelerate that. Uh, other one is disruption to our industry, technology, of course, and, and we are deep, deep into our digital transformation. We're probably going through about a four-year transformation, transformation, compressing it into two years in the logistics group, um, tackling all areas from applications to IoT, data analytics, AI, machine learning, an example of that. We, we've got a tool that we started working on in, in September and we're active, or I'm sorry, March of last year, and we're actively using it today. It's forecasting four weeks out to a 90% accuracy, what piece of equipment do we need at what customer and when do we need it there? So when we think about all these rail delays, we think about these truck delays, we think about all these types of things, right? If we can start making decisions four weeks out, continue to build on that with the machine learning and the AI, so maybe we can make those decisions six weeks out, we can really bring that repeatability or to use Mitch's words, consistency, right, to, to our customers and we can lower our cost to serve, right? And, and help hedge against some of this inflation that we're seeing. Others is just process excellence, reimagining everything, leveraging RPA bots, putting those into place. We stood up in 2021, 12 different bots, connecting some of our older legacy systems together, all of which will be replaced by the end of, of 2022. So 
Uh, the final thing that's keeping me up at night is, is the security issues out of China, trans-Pacific trade, the impact to the supply chain and all of that. What can we do as an industry? What can we do as Crowley going to the Hill, working with our DC representatives to bring more manufacturing to Puerto Rico, right? We've already talked about the stableness and, you know, two and a half day transit and, and a, pen, a dependable supply chain back to, back to the US. There's other regions as well. There's US Virgin Islands and there's either areas that are not included in, in the Jones Act where we think it's really, really important that we bring uh, more of that manufacturing back to the region. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. Eduardo, how about you? The most no, challenging no. factor. I, 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 I have to say that on the, on the environmental side, the fuel side, I, I've, we, we, we're really great uh, as far as the wisest decision probably we made on year 2012 to build the uh, LNG ships and, and have them in service by late 15 and, and early 16. That really took uh, a significant concern of, of the industry uh, by not only becoming a uh, the most eco-friendly you know aligner of the world at that time but also dealing with a with a field that that is price wise you know more consistent to to, to work with than, than than the regular diesel so we just been uh, harvesting the fruit of, the, of, of that wise decision uh, done many years ago and we've done other things like uh, you know, using uh, a friendly refrigerant in in in, in, a, in our gensets and, and other projects that we're working. Uh, as far as the uh, the biggest concern or what is actually still in, yes, the inflection, no no doubt about it. Even more in Puerto Rico that we have been really for nearly 15 years now living on, on a on a recession, and, and and thanks in a way to. To, to Hurricane Maria, the earthquakes that actually started, you know, generating a lot of uh, uh, economic activity. And then now the pandemic, we were heading toward uh, a major chaotic uh, situation. Uh, once again, you know, the pandemic brought about $9 billion to the people of the island that, that, that were subject to be uh, spent any way they wanted. That's gone now, that, 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 that is actually gone. And now we're starting, you know, seen the uh, major effects of the inflation in, in, in increases in, in almost everything. So that is truly concerning. And unless we actually see a new business uh, uh, economic model for the island, which in the opinion of many of us, including uh, what just Brett mentioned, you know, the, uh, the growth of the manufacturing sector, that is actually, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, the biggest concern right now. We are working directly with the government and other, uh, and other entities in the island trying to influence uh, many of these uh, uh, projects to, to, to happen. You know, we have a very strong bench for more than three decades on the medical device and, and pharma manufacturing sector. There's other business um, uh, sectors that can really have a potential for growth in, in, in Puerto Rico. And finding the, 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 the right dynamic with the, with the government. To, to incentivate those industries so we can actually start seeing you know um, more 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 growth of, of jobs in the island it's going to be it's going to be really fundamental in, in, in that sense we also have to make sure that the infrastructure funding uh, be properly allocated as well in, in order to continue having the best uh, asset base that, that we need to continue uh, claiming best of class you know uh, operations and, and and so on so in, in a nutshell, I think we got plenty with the inflation alone to 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 deal with uh, with uh, with uh, with the economy of the island for for the upcoming few years for sure. Thanks, Eduardo. Mitch, uh, we're getting close on time here, and I do see we have one question. Do you want any quick closing thoughts on uh, on what on, on that major factor that's challenging you? I think uh, for for me over the last couple of years, the number one thing that keeps me up at night is is making sure that. The people of Trailer Bridge are healthy and, and can can work, and their families are doing okay. Because if they're not here, then they're not serving customers. And and you know we we generally care about our people and their families, and so we've taken a lot of precautions um, in cleaning the offices and making sure that we have everything every every tool that's in the toolbox to keep it safe. And that's probably been the biggest thing that, that, that keeps me up at night. And, you know, getting my daily COVID report that we probably all get at some point, like how many people could be on this list today. So it's, it's, uh, it's challenging. Uh, we've been fortunate at Trailer Bridge, um, but that's probably the piece that, that definitely keeps me up at night. 
Thanks. Thanks. Uh, we have a, a question. Let's see if we can answer this quickly as a uh, lightning round. Anyone want to jump in on this one? Um, one of our audience members asking is how is debt financing helping to improve the industry these days? Anyone want to handle that? I'll throw in, I think debt financing is readily available. And I think this episode, as we've all talked about from the beginning, it's proven our business models and the Jones Act itself provides a lot of stability. And what debt investors want more than anything is stability. You know, it's a long-term credit bet. And our, you know, our businesses are solid and they're proven through this pandemic that they're solid and could be profitable. And that's probably only going to help debt financing for our industry in the future. Thanks, Joel. Looks like we're out of time, everybody. Uh, uh, there is one other question. Someone's asking whether this session is going to be uh, recorded and available later. I believe it is, but, but our organizers will be better suited to answer that. And uh, again, I wanted to thank our, our panel uh, and the audience for paying attention and for our friends at Capital Link for supporting this program. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for me to Thanks. tremendous panel, I have to say. Great discussion yes. Thank you to everybody. And yes, everything is going to be available for replay as soon as the uh, forum is over. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All. All right, bye bye.